PG. I am a member here at Pilgrim Congregational Church, um, but maybe you, some of you haven't seen me before. I'm often not here. I'm often out uh, doing other work on Sundays, but I'm really glad to be here today among my people. Uh, wonderful people. This is uh, this, the, the theme for today is on love, and I, I was thinking, how it's hard to preach a sermon about love at Pilgrim because there's so much love here in so many ways that love gets expressed. What do I tell you about love that you don't already know? Um, but that's what we're going to try to do today is talk a little bit about, about love. So as we prepare ourselves to join together in this exploration, let's take a moment for prayer. God, open our hearts, move among us, give us your word, draw us ever forward into your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So, uh, I love love. <laughs> I am really interested in love. Um, in part because of the work that I do. I work for a healthcare system and I partner with faith communities just like this one all around the metropolitan area in thinking about what makes for health, what makes us healthy uh, in our congregations, in our own personal lives, in our, and in our communities. And one of the things that I've learned after many years of doing this work is actually love makes us healthy. It's the most important thing for our health. It's more important than not smoking. It's more important than being the right weight. It's more important than not, than not abusing substances. The science tells us that when we love and when we feel loved, it impacts our health in amazing ways. So I love love. And I love the way the church is a place where we experience love. I was just at a conference on Friday um, on mental health. It was sponsored by the, uh, we have a national network on mental health in our denomination. And so they sponsored a, a conference on congregations becoming wise congregations around mental health. Welcoming, inclusive, supportive, and engaged. And the keynote speaker was uh, uh, Sarah Lunt Holmes, Holt, I think. She wrote this fantastic book called Blessed Are the Crazy. And it's really out of her own experience and testimony living in a family where there were severe mental health issues. And she said, church was the only place where I heard that I was loved. Church was the only place where I heard that I was loved. And that just really struck me, that that's true for many of us. Many of us experience, have experiences in our life that are difficult, that, that challenge us. And church is often a place that's a grounding force in our lives, that reassures us that we are loved, not only by each other, but by God, and that we are held in God's love. A few years ago, I did a study on relationships in, within faith communities. How do churches support and nurture social relationships? Because we know that it happens, but how? How are, how, what are people doing? And so I have hours of, of recordings of people telling me stories of how they have experienced love within their congregation or how they've seen that expressed. Um, so I'm not gonna share all of the stories with you, but I have a couple that I, just a couple, these are just, like randomly selected uh, quotes of people telling stories about how they've experienced love in their congregation. So this is from a woman who was uh, visiting a fellow member. Just last week, when I was visiting Alice, I thought at the last minute I'd bring her coffee. So I drove through McDonald's. I got coffee. And Alice is 94 or 96, and we sat at her cluttered kitchen table drinking McDonald's coffee. And she's a piano player. Now from memory, because she can't see, but somehow in the conversation, 
She started to tell me how every day she sings, Now thank we all our God. And she started to recite it. She started to forget the words, so I started to hum it and sing with her. And you know that, that was very healing for her and for me. That kind of connecting of our spirits. And she said to me as we talked about the lyrics of the hymn, I was so lonely today, and then you came. Another woman who's in a small group said, I love to look across the congregation and catch the eye of a group member. And I know that they are thinking about me and praying for me during the week, which is really like a bond. It's like a little rope that goes across a string that ties us together. And from a youth member who plays in the praise band, at this church they have this great thing they call a care card. So in the pews, they have these little yellow cards and envelopes. And if somebody's raised up in prayer during the service or they're just thinking of somebody, you can write a little note on the care card and put their name on the, it, seal it in the envelope, put their name on the front and hand it in with the uh, offering. And then the church will send out that care card to the, to the individual. Isn't that a great idea? We should do that. So anyway, this youth, this youth member said, the band will play in church, and all the old people, which I'm not sure like what exactly she means by that, <laughs> all the old people will write a little care note, care card note, like, oh, you sounded so good today, and you know that it was too loud for them, but they were so happy to see us up there. Story after story, and we could like sit all day long and tell our own stories of how we experience love. Love is the main thing that we're called to. It's powerful, redeeming, salvific, transformational in our lives. But it can also be really hard. And again, just this last week, I was in a number of different conversations with different groups about this idea of love and social connection, how important it is. And immediately, when you actually start to get into what that looks like, the hardness of it comes out. So one pastor said, you know, I totally believe in this, but there's someone in my congregation who has a lot of needs and they've attached to me. And I just find it's depleting and I find it overwhelming. And I'm not sure how, how much is enough. Another person told a story about how their congregation was wrestling with what to do with someone who was a sexual offender who wanted to come to their church, and whose family was a part of the church. How do they love a sexual offender? And it ended up being a huge issue in the church and, and a, a really nasty fight within the church about how do we love in this situation. Or another church that was really concerned about security. And someone stand, stood up in church and said, we don't want to have strangers wandering into our church. <laughs> I guess I don't apparently need to say any more about that. But, but it's a hard thing about how do you, how do you, this was, church was really wrestling with how do we protect safety, which is a real thing but also be a place that welcomes the stranger. Jesus says, abide in my love. Abide in my love so that we can keep Jesus' commandment that we love one another. Abide in my love so that we can keep the commandment that we love one another. Jesus calls us partners in his love. We are partners with Jesus, friends on the journey together with Jesus, which should give us confidence in our ability to love. And the key is, Jesus says, abiding in me, abiding in my love. And abiding refers to a love that's already present. We don't have to create it. 
We don't have to generate it from somewhere. Abide in my love. But in that passage, there's also a pesky if. If you abide in my love, you will keep my commandments. If you abide in my love, you must keep my commandments. If you're really loving, like I love you, you are keeping my commandments. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So what is the commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And even the early church struggled with how hard that can be. So the Acts story, I'm glad that you kind of set it up a little bit because um, that story of what do we do with someone and with other people that are um, hard to include, um, what do we do with this question of who is worthy? What do we do with reaching out when reaching out is actively met by repression and suppression and an active campaign of violence against that attempt to love. The church is wrestling with this. And within that, Peter has this vision that Claudia told us about of the unclean animals being sent down from heaven and Peter is told to eat of them. And he resists. And three times he has to have this vision before he finally starts to get it. Oh, okay, something new is being asked of me. It was a challenge to the purity laws in the Jewish culture. What is clean, what is unclean, who can be associated with, who can be part of the community. And this wasn't just prejudicial, sort of the way we think of it. This actually had to do with um, po pollution of my body, of my person, of my family, of my community. If someone else comes into it, it actually pollutes it and makes it uh, 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 broken. Um, so this was this was a very deep cultural, um, a very deep cultural prohibition against being with people who were different, who are not part of the Jewish circle. And at that time, actually, the apostles were only preaching to other Jews. They were not preaching outside of that because no one else would be worthy to hear that word. And so this thing where Peter is being asked now to meet with these people that Cornelius has sent, that we cannot underestimate how monumental that is. And this story actually gets repeated in various ways several times, I think because it's such an important story. So Peter, by receiving this vision, is abiding in God's love. He's trusting it, he's resting in it, and it gives him the self-centeredness, the centeredness, to be able to hear the invitation to do something radically outside of anything he could imagine, to love in a way that had, he had no experience with before. To do something absolutely contradictory to everything he had been taught that was what, it, what was in his bones, to open himself to fear, to the fear that's behind that, to responding and taking the step, to share his God and his precious connection with Christ with someone who is not just different, but actually polluting. That's hard inner work that has to happen. That's the work that's inside us that we have to do to prepare ourselves to love the way that Jesus is commanding us. That's the abiding. That's the abiding, is that inner work. That allowed Peter then to become a new kind of leader, abiding in God's love, trusting, immersing himself, staying connected to his source, believing in the power of it, having patience. When I hear the word abiding, I think of patience, steadiness. All of that allowed him to hear that call to act in a new way. So Jesus says, it's not just enough to abide in my love. It's not just enough to hear, but we also have to keep the commandment. You become the vessel. You become the vessel. You become my love 
in the world for others. And that creates fruitfulness. That creates joy. That creates transformation. That creates hope. Peter abided in love, and that allowed him to see in a new way the people and the possibility for a community of faith that ultimately was what was why the church flourished. The church flourished because it made space for people that were seen as polluted. That is why the church took off, because it was the people who were on the very margin who found a place there. We heard stories this morning in our uh, adult education about the experience of Japanese Americans, really profound stories of discrimination and marginal, marginalism, that marginalization and evilification um, of people, and an acceptance of it by our society. Um, and we know that this happens in so many ways. We could just recite them all day. Immigrants, people living with mental illnesses, returning citizens from prison, people with disabilities, gangbangers, the police, Republicans, Democrats. We could go on with all of the things, all of the people that we struggle to love and to embrace. But we were called to ask ourselves, what is the word that we speak as we abide in God's love? What is the way that we live as we abide in God's love? What is beyond our comprehension about who could be included in our circle? Because there are people, I'm sure, that we would wrestle with. What tests our sense of who is worthy? And how do we, how do we address that? There is a uh, scientist by the name of Greg Fashon. He's a... Um, I think he's a uh, neurological psychiatrist, if that's, if that's a thing. But anyway, he, he wrote this most fascinating book called Compassion and Healing in Medicine and Society. And what he does in that book is he traces um, the way in which attachment is part of the evolutionary process. And what he argues is that Separation challenges, this is his book, a book like this, but the basic core of it is separation challenges require attachment solutions. And that that's true at every stage, every part of life, from the, from the smallest cellular level. If a cell is threatened in some way, the cell that survives is the cell that attaches itself some way to something else, that finds a way to be with something else. That's the cell that survives. That's, the, that's the, uh, the organism that somehow is able to, to continue. So evolution is not actually the survival of the fittest. It's the survival of the most loving. And that's true for us, too. Our survival, our thriving, is based in our loving. And so may we continue as a community to struggle with what that means, the hardness of it, but also the joy of it, the fruitfulness of it, the transformation of it.